Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited. This is actually our one year anniversary of starting these meetings. Uh, the purpose of why we are doing these meetings are to give our members as much information as we possibly can about each of the departments here at APFA that are working for you every day. Um, this is our fifth quarterly membership meeting, and um, we're really excited that you're joining us today. These meetings are recorded, so you can take screenshots if you would like to during the meeting, but we also always put these on the website. Usually it takes us a couple days to get them on the website, um, and we are now trying to give you actually break it down into a, every department so that you don't have to go through the entire meeting to find the information you need on a certain department. So give us a couple days and that will be on the website and you'll see the entire meeting there also. This is not a negotiations town hall. Um, this so negotiations is the one department that won't be reporting out today. We do have that town hall scheduled for February 23rd at 1 p.m. So um, please tune in on that date for more information on negotiations. OK, today we'll, uh, we're going to get start with the website. We have a new website uh, that we introduced now a couple months ago, and uh, we want to kind of walk you through all of the information that is on the website. And Josh and I are going to do that together today because Josh has been a key our role in getting this website out uh, to the members. Yeah, we were really excited to launch this in December. Um, a lot of work went into it, about a year's worth of work between all of our departments and the website team did a really great job putting this together. We have hundreds of new pages to help you um, get the information that you need whenever you need it. So we're going to walk through a couple of the uh, new pages that we did. OK, let's start with, of course, negotiations. Um, this negotiations page was actually the first page developed. Just want to remind everyone that there is a lot of information here on what is actually happening at the table. Transparency is really important to us here, and we wanted to make sure that you have all the information you need to make an informed vote when it comes that time. Probably the most information about actually what is being uh, proposed at the table and agreed to is on the negotiation status page. Josh, if we can go there. And this page, if you scroll down on it, you'll see uh, this is the opener uh, that we presented recently. Oh, I shouldn't say recently. Now it's been quite a while ago. Uh, you can click down on each of these sections and you can see uh, what we've proposed. Uh, for economics, of course, we don't have the actual figures in there yet. We will be proposing economics in March, so we'll, we'll fill this in later. Uh, let's go down to the open sections. Right now, we are passing scheduling and reserve as a couple of examples, and you can see here exactly what's happening at the table. After we come back from every negotiation sec sec uh, meeting, excuse me, um, we do update this section. Let's go over to uh, another page, Josh. Okay. Um, so one of the things we really want to highlight at the top are these new sections to help you find the information that you um, are looking for. Uh, news obviously is for our plot lines. Um, you can watch our various town halls that we've done. We also have a town hall coming up next Friday for um, retirement seminar as well, virtually. Um, we have a bidding tab to help you uh, find more information about the various bidding tools that we use on the job and resources. And I think we're going to go into a couple pages. Yeah, let, let's on the job is, of course, one of my favorite um, areas of the website today. Let's look at reserve uh, because we have a lot of flight attendants who let's unfortunately are back on reserve. They haven't sat reserve in a long time and unfortunately they are on reserve or even if you're only on reserve every once in a while, this page will really help you out. Uh, because it talks about how to bid in PBS for reserve, um, your reserve line. It talks about how to bid in Rodin, RODA. Let's go to the RODA bidding page. And on this page, uh, you can scroll down. It'll walk you through everything, but also there's a video to make it pretty easy for you to understand how to put in a RODA bid. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back up to the top. On the job, of course, another uh, very informative page is rescheduling and pay protections. Uh, when you're out on the line and you can't get a hold of someone or you just know that I know I've seen this information, this is where you can go to and you will probably find it as far as what you need to do in a rescheduling situation. Legalities, hotels, there's plenty on this page. Let's go over to resources because 
this has really changed from what it used to be. I think if we go to the top, Josh, and we look at um, DEX add and removal codes, this is really helpful when you're looking at your HI1 and you see a code on there and you're not exactly sure what it means, let's type in XR, which is one of our pay protection codes. You can type in the code and then hopefully, it's right here. There it goes. Yeah. And then it'll give you the explanation of that code right there. We also have a complete table of all of the codes that are used, and um, you can see everything here. Uh, so please make sure you check this out. It'll really help you to understand uh, what is on your HI1. And also under resources, we have various uh, information items about pay, um, EAP page, our health page, IOD, and a couple other um, really helpful resources. You know, there's one other page that we really like that we uh, haven't talked about yet, and it's under um, bidding and monthly bidding PBS and PBS award files. Um, this will allow you to see after you log in um, oh. PBS awards for different bases. Yeah. So if you're looking at transferring, you can kind of get an idea of what um, you may be able to hold at other bases. So this is a great resource too. That is really a great resource um, for many reasons. Uh, it is the transparency we really need with PBS and now it's there for you. Okay, all right. So with that, let's move on. We've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, the first department that we're gonna go to is our SBA department and Larry Salas, our national vice president is gonna talk about um, some recent meetings that we had. Good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, welcome. Glad to have everyone join us today. Um, the SBA department, as well as the VP, has had a very challenging past year. We've seen a significant uptick in grievances and flight attendant terminations. And while the company refused to hear many of our QSB cases, delaying our contractual right to a timely resolution, our department worked tirelessly fighting to obtain fair and equitable settlements um, for our affected flight attendants. So we're pleased to announce that in the last month, the SBA department working together with our regional reps who are actually here today with us um, in Unity Pays and our um, APFA in-house legal counsel, we were able to reach settlements on many outstanding QSB and termination grievances. So as you can see on, this, on the slide presentation here, we uh, were able to uh, settle over 120 quarterly um, system board uh, grievances that were uh, clogged up in the SBA department, again, because the company, um, uh, you know, was refusing to hear many of our cases. Um, we met with them recently, and again, we were able to uh, to uh, obtain multiple uh, settlements in various attendance um, related discipline. We were able to reduce points, uh, specifically related to uh, COVID points, LCs related to FMLA and um, PO days. Also early boarding uh, and various pay claims related to contractual violations, as you see here, illegal rescheduling, red flag and TTS, holding trips out of Rota D, schedule versus actual, equipment substitutions, and jury duty pay. In addition, we're proud to announce that we were able to return to work 25 uh, flight attendants whom APFA uh, we felt that the, the termination was far too severe a consequence um, in ending flight attendants' careers. And um, those uh, highlights of those settlements included um, those terminated for attendance, reserve out of base, and various performance related issues. So um, we'll continue uh, and we're committed to advocating for the rights of our members and ensuring that our contract is enforced and our members receive fair and equitable treatment in the workplace. And we'll continue to work tire tirelessly towards these goals. And we're confident um, and we're hopeful that the company will continue uh, to work with us here and um, uh, get more settlements uh, in the future. So, thank you, Larry. Thank you. OK, we're moving on to our government affairs specialist, and this is Ali Malice. Hi everyone. Um, we have a lot of momentum with contract negotiations right now and we really need to keep that up. 
Um, nothing in our contract is given. We have to fight for it. So keep wearing your pins, your lanyards, um, and showing up for pickets. But apart from contract negotiations, we do have another type of lever that we can kind of pull to improve our working condition, and that's passing new laws. So you might remember in 2020, payroll support program was passed not once, not twice, but three times, um, saving thousands of jobs. And just a few months ago, the 10 hour minimum rest was finally pushed through to implementation. Um, both of these were legislated as opposed to negotiated. Um, you can see that the legislation, the legislative process is not fast. It takes a lot of patience, persistence, strategy, <coughs> relationships, visibility, and yes, money. And we'll get to the APA by PAC in a moment. Um, but here's a little synopsis of what's going on in Washington this year um, with a new Congress just sworn in. Um, earlier this week, uh, my colleague Lori and I were in Washington to officially meet the newly elected members of our Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And we also attended the first big aviation safety hearing of the year, where members of Congress raised questions about cabin air quality, disruptive passengers, and emergency evacuation standards. And we have an opportunity this year to make some big improvements in all of these areas. So this would be separate from you know, what we can gain in negotiation. Um, so it's an extra important year this year for flight attendants because the FAA bill must be passed um, by September to keep the FAA funded. And as this bill is being written, APFA will not only be advocating for provisions that help flight attendants, but also opposing provisions that could harm our profession as well. And so that's why it's really important that APFA stays visible and present on Capitol Hill. And you may have seen in the hotline just uh, a few weeks ago that APFA President Julie Hedrick was in Washington um, with Lori and I talking to lawmakers, including the Senate Commerce Chair Maria Cantwell, who will essentially be writing the first draft of this FAA bill very soon. So an important person for us to meet with. Um, and there's also going to be times this year that we're going to need your help to contact your members of Congress, your senators, and we try to make that really easy for you. So um, keep an eye out for hotlines um, where, with that call to action, and you'll have the option to send a pre-drafted message. It only takes a few seconds for you to click, click, and send. Um, and there might be a certain point where we might need a team to fly into Washington also, so keep an eye out for future information on lobby days and other events in Washington, D.C. And now back to the pack. <laughs> um, that's the camera. Yeah, today oh. is <laughs> You've been looking at the wrong camera. It's okay, it's been on our side. Okay, good. <laughs> um, the work we do in Washington is not possible without the APFA PAC, simply put. Um, it gives us a lot of access to members of Congress. It helps us shape a more flight attendant friendly Congress. Um, here's an example. In 2020, um, the airlines would have probably preferred the government aid to come in the form of a blank check. But instead, the payroll support program prohibited worker furloughs, uh, prevented uh, increases to executive compensation, prevented stock buybacks, all things that uh, workers would not have seen any benefit to. And similarly, the 10 hour minimum rest was really hard fought as well. Um, and it took our path to really have that influence to educate lawmakers about the urgency to get that implemented. Um, we talked to members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. And make no mistake that the airlines are lobbying and giving money to members of Congress right now with their corporate budgets. Um, some of their interests do not align with ours, but the APFA PAC contributions carry weight because they're voluntary contributions. They come from working people. They mean a lot. And we have the potential to be really powerful because we are 25,000 members strong. So your small contribution from $1, $2, $5, $10 um, gets us a seat at the table where these decisions are made. So if you have your mobile device handy or if you're on your computer, this might be a nice time to open another tab. Go to www.apfa.org slash PAC. Um, there's lots of information for you to learn more about the PAC. Um, and in just a couple clicks, you'll be supporting our union's access to lawmakers so that we can continue to make legislative gains um, for our flight attendants in Washington. Thank you so much, Allie. That was very um, informative. I just wanted to let Allie know, and Josh and Eric, we had, well, we continue to have new hires come in and visit APFA. Yesterday, we were shocked at we had a stack this big yeah. um, 
pack contributing people to contributing to the pack and new hires, new yeah. hires. Yeah. who are just starting Good. out. Yeah. So um, thank you to, to Josh and Eric. Um, they do a presentation on the importance of PAC, you know, yeah. and I know you're part of that slide <laughs> and presentation too. Uh, so it has really, um, even for our new hours, new hires, um, made a made a point. Yeah, thank so, you, thank, thank you. you guys so much. All right, okay, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Ali. Thanks, Larry. And we are moving on now to Kai Kamos, who is one of our contract action team leaders. Kai. Yes, thank you, Julie. Um, so the obje objective of contract action team is to engage and inform all 25,000 flight attendants um, here at American Airlines. Uh, flight attendants armed with correct information regarding negotiations um, is extremely powerful in this negotiation process. Currently, we have about 2,500, um, but again, there are 25,000 of us on the line um, and a unified front uh, is our greatest weapon. Um, next slide, please. On January 24th, we conducted our second system-wide picket demonstration with an estimated 20, sorry, 2,000 participants across the system. Uh, currently, these picketing informational picketings are one of our many tools to inform the public about our status in the negotiations process um, and to apply pressure onto American Airlines um, to negotiate in good faith. Uh, we'll continue to implement these types of action events, um, and we need your participation. Next, please. On February 14th, contract action team will be in the terminals um, in the red APFA t-shirts, um, conducting outreach to flight attendants, um, handing out our We Are Ready uh, red lanyards um, and union pins and speaking with crews about negotiations. Uh, we want, the objective is kind of to have the site of contract action team and the red shirts um, in airports to be you know, a common theme for flight attendants um, and also so we can be a resource for them uh, as we continue with negotiations. Next, please. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, we need you to join the contract action team. Information is power. Um, please show solidarity by wearing the red lanyards and your union pins. Um, and we're working tirelessly to get those into the hands of flight attendants. Um, the sign up for contract action team, you can use this QR code here, and we have those flying around, or you can go to APFA.org under negotiations, contract action, um, and join us. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Our contract action team is really working hard. Uh, and trying to make sure that everyone has lanyards, pins, also that you know the information that is being negotiated at the table. That's one of the things, if you see a contract action team member, they are really making sure that they are uh, looking at all the information that is being sent out by the negotiating team and trying to help our flight attendants as much as possible understand what is happening at the table. So thank you, Kai. Uh, we're going to move on next to uh, Jeff Peterson, who is our contract chair, and Marty McMillan, who is our scheduling chair. Good uh, morning in Dallas and afternoon on the East Coast. Uh, Marty and I wanted to review. There we go. We wanted to talk about PBS awards and the reason report and just take a few minutes to review um, some information that is available to you every single month when uh, when PBS awards come out. So if to access your reason report, go to the award tab in PBS and just above your award information is a tab called view reason report. Um, it, this tab it contains the information that will help you understand your own. Um, we just want to go over some of the information that is contained on this tab today. So one of the things that um, we see a lot of uh, we get a lot of phone calls about, we also get a lot of emails and we see it on social media is, why didn't I get the days off that I asked for when I'm on reserve? And one of the reasons is what's called a coverage needed date. And that's a date that for whatever reason, there just isn't enough flight attendants bidding to work on that day. So you are being, because of your seniority or juniority, um, you're being required to fill the coverage on that date. And you can see a list, and in our example here, you can see this particular person actually had quite a few coverage needed dates um, for the month. Even line holders are subjected to coverage needed dates. And um, for instance, uh, with the Super Bowl, that would be a weekend that we probably saw lots and lots of coverage needed um, in every single base, not just Phoenix or Super Bowl. 
So, <laughs> so uh, if you do have coverage needed dates, they will build a schedule around you. Unfortunately, though, once you start getting so many coverage needed dates, it's very hard for them to build a legal line with what you did. So you'll see that you get a schedule that's a legal line, but you're going to be held to covering as many of those dates as possible. OK, so also on your reasons report, um, it will have information about any required minimum line credit value. What this means is that if you were forced to hold a certain amount of hours. Recently, um, we have seen flight attendants at almost all bases. Well, all bases have been held to a minimum and at eight of our 10 bases at the, the most senior flight attendant at a base as at most bases has been held to at least 70 hours. So the, we just want to point out where you can see whether that um, this these uh, minimum line values affected you. So right here under your uh, reason report, you can see where it says required minimum line credit value and that number to the right of that will show you what your um, what your line value was or what your minimum line value was. Um, so the reason why this is happening, there's many factors that go into this, but one of the reasons is the line averages are higher than they, they have been historically. And additionally, bidding behavior has changed. Flight attendants are not generally speaking, are not bidding high, and many are preferring to bid low for whatever reason. Um, and, in, and, in, and in this one illustrates that even aside from 70 hours, some of our more junior flight attendants are being held to at least 78 hours. So what we really want to, you to walk away with today is just an understanding of how your reason report can help you understand um, what happened in your PBS award. So when we go to the next slide, one of the things that you can see is you, it's possible to have coverage needed as well as being held to a minimum, meaning you had to fly at least 70 or more hours um, because of your seniority. Uh, you can also have what's called layer none or an LN, and, and usually that is because you bid a TCR, total uh, target credit range, that was uh, lower than what was required for your seniority. And so it had to go outside of your layers in order to complete your uh, award. And then also um, in this particular example that we show, you see pairing none, meaning that the person didn't bid enough actual sequences in their bid for their seniority. And so they were forced into having additional trips put on their schedule. So if you're seeing that you're getting uh, not the satisfaction that you'd like to get out of PBS, <laughs> we'd like uh, you know to just take a look at your reason report. A lot of what you're seeing will be explained there, and that's that's a good start to see what you need to like draw back on or change in your PBS bidding. And then there's a lot of resources. There's great videos um, on our website. We've done a couple of town halls where we talk about reserve bidding as well as line bidding. Um, and you can just kind of skip through it when you get to the parts that don't pertain to what you're doing. And then there's great resources also on crew change um, on JetNet as well. OK, thanks, Marty and Jeff. That's great. Not always great information, though, as far as everybody being held to a minimum, right? right. That is something that we are uh, every month on our staffing calls with our base leadership, which are our base presidents and our base vice presidents. Um, this has been a constant work in progress to try and uh, figure out a better way uh, because we know that our flexibility is definitely being affected by everyone being held to a minimum. So thank you very much. Uh, for that information. And we're moving on next to Marcus Ricarte, who is our EAP co-chair. Marcus, you're on mute. All right. Thank you, Julie. Um, welcome, to, welcome to today's meeting, all members meeting. Um, I'm Marcus Ricarte, your EAP, APFA EAP um, specialist. Um, since we launched our new modernized EAP program, uh, we've received a lot of calls from all of you. And I just want to remind you that EAP provides three different service arms. Um, first one would be uh, EAP provides emotional support and assistance to flight attendants and their families. 
APAFA, EAP, or Employee Assistance Program can offer flight attendants peer support in addition to assessment and referrals. Now, many of you have thought our professional standards went away. No, we still have prof professional standards, and it's a self-help aid among our flying partners for providing conflict resolution strategies to those in need. Now, flight attendants are encouraged to contact APFA EAP professional centers to resolve conflict rather than requesting action from management. The next um, service arm would be Critical Incidents Response Program, which provides a range of crisis intervention strategies in the aftermath of critical incidents or workplace trauma. Now, the Critical Incidents Response Team will uh, transition under the EAP starting March 1st. The current um, EAP representatives in the team will be doing advanced training February 20th. If we can move to the next slide. Now, since go back one, please. One more. Oh, All right. <laughs> Thank you. So um, since January 1st, um, this is what the trends are. Uh, we have an increased call for self-help related to substance use, um, increased co-incurring anxiety and depression. Um, and this is really good because flight attendants feel that they have an avenue, um, confidential avenue to address substance use either with them themselves or with family members. And we've really helped a lot of individuals, including family members, seek help. Um, calls related to sick points, filing for FMLA um, is some of the calls that we've have taken. Um, and obviously with sick points, we can't help represent you, but we can certainly um, support the emotions and the anxiety and the stress around maybe a meeting or the, or the points that you're rocking up. Um, but we will refer you to those within your base your base reps or the APFA national uh, contract scheduling team to, to help you through the representation part, but we can certainly help you with the emotions and the stress around that. Obviously, professional standards calls, reports of not following safety and security protocols, social media and work style has been a lot of the calls that we've been um, managing. If we can go on to the next slide. Um, and then we have the Flight Attendant Drug and Alcohol Program, FADAP, is a substance abuse prevention program created and promoted for and by the Flight Attendant's profession and funded by the FAA. Um, for help, you can call 855-333-2327, or you can go to www.fadap.org for more information. Uh, to reach us, if you can go to the next slide, um, we are available 24-7, and um, you can reach a trained EAP representative, um, and we have trained representatives assigned to your base. So wherever your base, whether it's LaGuardia, Miami, Boston, Phoenix, LA, Dallas, um, Charlotte, DC, you have reps assigned to those bases and they can certainly help you by uh, you can call them or you can call us by calling 833-214-2002 and they will connect you confidentially to your base EAP representative. Um, if they do not pick up, then the call will be transferred to me or my colleague Deb McCormick and then we will um, service your, your request for help. If we do not pick up, because obviously we could be on other calls, that call would be generated into a text to us and then we'll call you within that hour. Uh, so we are available to you. The team has been working very hard to support our colleagues because there's a lot of things and stress and family issues, financial issues, substance use issues that we are facing, um, especially around the heavy schedules that we fly. So I want you to all know that we are here. We are flight attendants helping flight attendants, and we are here to help you uh, with whatever your needs are. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. <clears throat> okay, we're moving on to our health chair, and that's Kathy Sharp. Hi, everyone. I want to take uh, this opportunity to go over some contact information for our and Flight Service Administration. We seem to get a lot of phone calls and emails regarding uh, 
flight attendant is contacting the wrong department to assist them with their issues. So accident and return center, is, you might want to think of it in terms of uh, they're the ones who process and review all of your medical documentation um, via the absence tracker. They do, they process your return to work substantiation um, and they approve and deny your leave request. Now, if you have questions about your leaves, uh, there is a short term leave desk. Uh, Flight Service Administration. I guess I should click my slides. <laughs> there you go. Um, and you might even take screenshots of these slides. It might be helpful because it has the emails and the phone path to reach these departments. Um, so short term administration is processing intermittent family leaves, pandemic leaves for those states that still have it, state and local leaves, jury duty, military, and calling in well for intermittent family leaves. If you have questions about long term leave, such as your block family leaves, medical leaves, maternity, uh, even injury on duty, this is the long laundry list, so this would be a good one to take a picture of. This is going to be to fa.admin at aa.com. Just hope you find this information useful. Um, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to APFA Health Department. APFA. Thank you, Kathy. Did you have one more slide? There we go. All right. OK, we're moving on to our hotel department and our hotel chair is Michael Hello. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the APFA National Hotel Department, we want to thank each and every one of you for your continued feedback. Any issues that you receive while by out with flying, um, especially for situations like last week when the weather was crazy, IROPs were going on. You truly are the eyes and the ears on the ground. So all the feedback that you submit to the APFA hotel department, those channels are below at the very bottom of the slide. That feedback is recorded, documented, and escalated within our union, as well as our point of contact at the company. Um, that feedback also is very crucial and important to drive when we're reviewing and looking at our layover markets that we stay at. So if you look at the slides above, um, below you'll see our planned layover inspections. So a layover inspection is planned for many reasons. One of those could be the feedback that you are submitting, the issues that you're experiencing on the line, or often a contract might be expiring. And sometimes in the unfortunate event, hotel partners will cancel their contract and we'll need to go see these markets. We're also seeing what we see pop-up markets, which is um, layovers that in markets that we normally do not see that network planning tells the contract scheduling team at American around the 8th of the month. And we see these pop up markets. Arise for in our you know, bid packets and our hotels, so we need to make sure that we have JCBA compliance section 6 contractual overnight transportation for our flight attendants. You can see below too, our team has been very busy since our last meeting. These are all the markets that we have reviewed. So you can see and anticipate some changes. Maybe some sometimes when we review a market, it's just meeting with our current hotels. Often the hotel might be the best product in that market. And it's essentially just tweaking some you know, transportation or room placement or just addressing the feedback that you're providing at our hotels and our incumbent properties. So when we get all this feedback, um, a lot of things happen after we travel with the American Airlines Hotel Contracts team. Um, changes can occur in a market. So you'll see at the very top is a list of all the additional hotels added to a layover market. So in COVID, as you know, many hotels were closing, many like, occupants was very low. So for an example, in Atlanta, we only had one contracted property. Our room cap numbers are back up. So we need to go back to the Atlanta market, find another JCB compliant property that will secure and hold all the rooms needed for our crew members. The next list of hotels in the cities below are our incumbent properties that were replaced with a new hotel. So those are often wins for us when we go into a market um, an old property that we've been at for several years that we're getting negative feedback on. It gives us the opportunity to replace that hotel with a new one. The next list of cities below 
um, is that unfortunate situation. Um, an example such as in Portland, um, I know a lot of our flight attendants loved the hotel in Vancouver, Washington. Um, that hotel chose to no longer move forward, not just with American, but it's essentially their business mix, what they see for the goals of their property. So oftentimes you often hear a lot of flight attendants online say, well, the hotel just doesn't like crew, they don't want us. Put yourself in the hotel shoes. A big, hard, a big challenge with hotels is our crew check-in and check-out patterns. So, you know, normally a hotel checks in, normal guest at three o'clock, checks out at 11. So a lot of hotels we're seeing are having staffing issues with their housekeepers, their transportation providers, and it's advantageous for them to manage their business from a check-in at three and a check-out at 11. So when we have our crews enter a market and we say, well, we want to enter the hotel at 8 a.m., then leave 30 hours later at 5 p.m., it's very problematic. So um, we see hotels not want to renew those contracts, and in those markets below that occurred, um, and there have been three new properties added. If you need any info, details on where to pick up your transportation and your layovers, what properties that we're staying at and that are contracted, all that information can be found on CCI under HIDIR, and we also mirror that same information on the APFA website under on the job um, hotel section. Thank you, Michael. All right, we're moving on to our ACT Art Specialist, and that is Barrington Johnson. Good morning, everyone. So basically, as you can see here, um, on January 26th of this year, the de-escalation working group, we were sunsetted by the FAA Steering Committee. So basically what that means is they've taken the program that we worked on for 18 months, they have all the facts on it. Now they're waiting to decide when they will turn it over to the airlines to implement it. So as far as the working committee is concerned, we've been sunsetted. Uh, we were advised that we may be doing some future work on uh, possibility on turbulence in that they want to make sure that all pilots and flight attendants or all carriers are using the same terminology, the same phrasing when we convey turbulence to our customers on flights. So we're waiting to find out when that will be. Um, the next meeting we have scheduled will be May 10th and 11th and probably around May 1st, they'll advise us if we'll be on board for that. Thank you. Thank you, Barrington. Good information. I think it's really important that we're all using the same terminology for many things, right? right. <laughs> All right, we're moving on to our IOD chair, and that is Valley Paxson. Good morning, everyone. Um, one of our frequently asked questions in the last really couple of weeks have been how to file an IOD, and I, most of the calls are from our newer flight attendants. So American, uh, you can call American Airlines, their IOD nurse. Um, they are 24-7. And you can call uh, call them at 844-777-8463. And the calls are answered by registered nurses who will assess and recommend appropriate medical care. And once your IOD report has been completed, the nurse uh, will send you the AAIOD pamphlet and the physical demands, which is really the job description for the flight attendant. And also keep in mind, you are not required to follow the nurse's recommendation. You are free to seek medical treatment and just advise the registered nurse of your intention. And please be sure to file a SERS report and an ASAP report. Um, you will find the forms on the flight service website by clicking on policies and procedures, safety, security. The forms are under event reporting. And also one of the questions that we are asked is the timeline for filing an IMD. So if you are based in Phoenix, it would be as soon as possible or when you become aware of your injury. And in Pennsylvania, you have 21 days to file an injury. California, Florida, New York, North Carolina, Texas, and Virginia within 30 days. Massachusetts is also as soon as possible. If you have any questions, you can always call us at APFA and, or go to the website under resources and click IOD. 
Thank you, Belly. There's a lot of really good information on the website about IADEA and, and all, especially the state information. Yes. And that's where it's really helpful for you to be able to go in and read that if, depending on where you're based. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Next up, we have Patrick Hancock here with us today, who is going to be talking about retirement. Thank you, Julie. Over at the retirement department, one of the most common complaints we get of, about the 401k is that there just aren't enough investment options. I have good news for everyone. There is a way that you can invest your 401k money in almost any legal U.S. investment without losing the protection of being within a 401k. How? Well, the broker's link. And the broker's link is a stock investment option inside of the 401k. Well, how, how, how do I do that? Well, um, you, you call the Fidelity or go online. Online, look for the little broker's link uh, button. Click that. You open a broker's link account. You transfer money from your 401k investment into the brokerage link. And when you do that, remember that this is higher risk because you're going into stocks instead of carefully guarded investment options. So you want to transfer, you know, a small portion like 10% or something uh, or whatever you feel you can afford to put at higher risk. Once you've got the money in that brokerage link account, you can invest in almost anything sold on a U.S. exchange. And profit. There you go. All right. Well, can I invest in stocks? Absolutely. You want to go buy, go buy uh, GameStop or uh, Best of Bath on Beyond? Go for it. You can invest in that. Yeah, it's a meme stocks. It's a world. Out there. <laughs> okay, mutual funds. Yes, you can invest in mutual funds. You've got your favorite mutual fund out there. Go invest in that. Lots of options out there. There we go. Uh, how about EFTs? What? If, yeah, yeah, EFTs, exchange traded funds. And an exchange traded fund is a type of pooled investment so security that operates very much like a mutual fund, except uh, a typical EFT will, will track like the Dow Jones average or the S&P 500, or you can do an EFT that will track uh, oil and gas. You can even do an EFT that tracks transportation if you're really feeling risky. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, but unlike mutual funds, EFTs can be purchased or sold on a stock exchange the same way a regular stock can be, which makes it so much easier to invest in it. How about ADRs? A what? Well, Patrick, I'm an international flight attendant. I my worldview is bigger than America. <laughs> so I can invest in foreign stocks through an ADR, and that's an American depository receipt. An American depository receipt, somebody, usually a bank, has gone out and purchased, let's say, stock on a South Korean stock market, wrapped it up in a wrapper, and they will sell you shares of that. So you're actually investing in a foreign uh, stock on an American stock exchange. You can do that in the brokerage link. Hey, yes, Patrick, but my world is bigger than even that. Okay, we've got GDRs, global deposit receipts. All right, same thing, except those are uh, stocks that could be across a whole broad range of different countries. So you've got the GDRs there. What else have we got? We've got commodity futures, EFTs. You want to invest in pork bellies? Go for it. You can do that through an EFT in your 401k and still have all of that protection. So is there something, uh, something we can't invest in? Well, not much. Yes, yes, yes. But there is one thing you are not allowed to invest in out there. And that is AAL stock. Which is probably a really smart idea to not invest in. Anyway, OK. <laughs> <laughs> How about crypto? Coming soon. If you will go on the uh, Fidelity website, you will see that if you're in the brokerage link, you can even invest in crypto through your 401k. So. Patrick, you said something about the protection of a 401k. What are you talking about? Well, a 401k is a product of federal law, and it has some protection to it that a lot of other investments don't have. For instance, um, if you get sued and they take everything you've got, they can't touch your 401k because federal law says it's 100% protected from, from liability creditors. But what about my IRA? Well, that depends on what state you live in. The state law determines what your protection is in a, an IRA. I think it's Michigan that has the first $50,000 you get to keep. The rest of it goes to that person that sued you. So um, how about inheritance? 401k is inherited by 
your heirs differently than an IRA is inherited. So depending on your estate plan and what your goals are, one may be better for you than another. I hear frequently people say, well, my financial advisor says that I don't have enough options in my 401k. And I'm thinking, broker's like, you don't have enough options yet? Okay, so they want me to move it into the IRA. That may be a great idea, but you wanna make sure that it's for your benefit and not because your financial advisor is gonna get a huge commission when they, you transfer their hundreds of thousands of dollars into an IRA and they make a commission on that. It may be good, it may be bad, just make sure you know what you're doing. So lots of options in the brokerage link. Great information, Patrick. Thank you so much for that. And I always love the, and the spirit that it's delivered. <laughs> Great. All right, we're moving on to our safety chair, Andrew Reinhardt, and uh, let's go to his slides here about it. Thank you. How can I follow that? <laughs> I learned so much, but you, you energized me, so <laughs> just the kind of topic and go with it. I was like, you could sit with Russell. <laughs> All right, so um, I put a hotline out about this that there, and this is coming up, this March is around the corner, that there's going to be changes to door closer procedures. Now, the only real change is that the gate agents are going to be closing the door from now on. And the company tries to make it sound like it's going to be okay because they refer to this cute little three piece of bins, bags, and three queens. And if those are completed, everything's fine. They can close the door. However, what is not mentioned is that there is an FAR behind this, and it's FAR 121-589, and that reads, each article of baggage carried on board an aircraft must be properly stowed prior to closure of the passenger cabin door, surface movement, takeoff, and landing of the aircraft. So, let me just go through the steps real quick. The agent's still going to come down to the aircraft, deliver the final paperwork to the captain. We are going to be completing this requirement of us that they're calling the three Bs, but it is more important than just a catchy little thing. And we'll go to the flight deck, we'll say cabin secure, okay to close. We get the okay to close from the captain. Then we tell the gate agent, we're okay to close. Everything's ready. Now, I'm sure it's happened to everybody in this room on the line. We've had that flight deck door, excuse me, the, cap, uh, the aircraft door shut on us. We weren't ready to go. Um, and that, if that happens to you out there, what I would advise is that this needs to be reported. And the way you should report this is through a cabin ASAP. And the topic that I would report it under is either to a change in policy or an FAR violation. And I bet you could do general and safety concern, but I would more so put it in that direction. Uh, and the SIRS. And the topic for the SIRS, I would do operational issues. This data will be important when this change comes for accountability purposes. Now. All right, before we go to this next slide, oh, we're on the slide. So um, but before we start talking about this program, um, there's been a lot of conversations, a lot of emails, a lot of information out there about this. We hear you. We've heard the concerns of a lot of our flight attendants. We have been working this week internally um, on this issue with our board and, and having more discussions. And we've had lots of discussions uh previously but we're having more discussions now and we've also met with the company so today um, i want to let everybody know there will be a hotline coming up uh sometime this afternoon we're still working on that and um, we'll get that out to our members so please stay tuned for that um but also uh i want you to know that today we just want to give you some facts about the program that's it we're not going to get into anything else about it today it is just the facts and Andrew, if you just want to walk through the program so everybody has those facts, and then please look for the hotline this afternoon. Know that your officers, your board, your chairs, we're all working on this issue, and we, we will make sure that any program that comes out to our flight attendants here at American Airlines is a program that it, number one, would never, ever allow another flight attendant to um, basically tell them another flight attendant, right? This, we would never allow that here. So um, let's just talk about the facts and um, then we'll go from there. All right, so back to talking about LOSA. So cabin line operation safety audit, LOSA, is a data collection program only for safety. It is only collecting safety data. Now, like the existing flight LOSA, which they've had for about 12 years, and we have, there's one for the dispatch program as well. 
and other airlines utilize these in other forms like United, Alaska, etc. But cabin loves and I want this to be heard is voluntary, confidential, and it's non punitive. It is a safety program. The cabin loves program will afford flight attendants the same opportunity to provide meaningful safety data that is currently afforded to pilots and dispatchers. Their, their respective flight LOSA dispatch and LOSA programs are able to communicate this to their peers. It's like a safety conversation. Cabin LOSA is not a check or a QAR is what they call it at the right now quality assurance, right? It's 100% a safety program and completely sanitary. The goal of the observations is to mitigate potential risks such as injuries, inadvertent flight deployments as, as an example, and determine where there are issues within our current safety guidelines and our policies and procedures, just like the one I mentioned before, and to further promote a safer working environment for flight attendants by flight attendants. This is achieved through peer to peer observations by fellow flight attendants and not by members of management or FAA inspectors. OK, one last question on this. What is the program we have today that is our auditing system for this? It is QARs, quality assurance rides, also known as check rides, and they are not voluntary. And if this program were to go in, would QARs go away? I believe so, yes. Just replace it. Thank you. All right, let's move on uh, to Adam Brooks, who is our national ballot chair. Oh boy, we're in election season. Are we are and we are off and running. Please here. One second. So uh, real quick, uh, the one stop shop to find a lot of the information for our election is going to be the union elections um, tab at the top of the website there. And if you scroll down just a little bit, uh, you'll see there's some really important information right up at the top. So the candidate booklets are there uh, with that button. That is where you can go to view the uh, information on uh, the candidates that are uh, in these respective elections. At this time right next to it uh, is the request duplicate ballot. Keep in mind the ballots were just mailed out this week on the 7th on Tuesday. So please give time for the US Postal Service to make its way to your house, your ballot before you uh, sign on a request, but there is an information. A little bit of a change um, to this is you'll be requesting that duplicate ballot directly through our election partner, VS Election. So there's a dedicated support desk set up. The phone number is there uh, as well as the email that is help plus APFA at VS Elections. If you click that request duplicate ballot button, the great thing is it opens up your email, whatever your email program is you're using, and it'll auto fill in that email address and you can just simply send them an email. Uh, we ask that you just provide them with your current address just in case there's an update needed, they can send that out to you. Um, and then if you want to go to the slide, I think there, if you scroll down a little bit, there's a timeline there that talks a little bit about when stuff is opening and closing, um, and then the candidates right there as well as those that were duly elected and the hotlines if you'd like to refer back are also at the bottom. And then the candidate booklets right there. Yep. And if you want to click on that real quick. And it's broken down by base, so you can simply go to your respective base and the election and open up uh, any of the candidate booklets. OK, and that is a change. Right in the past, we used to that used to go out with the ballots. So 2021, it was changed to electronic. Um, and it's been really popular because you can access it from anywhere. It also helps uh, reduce the cost, obviously. Um, but there is also on the ballot that you're going to get in the mail. There's a QR code and a link on the ballot. And so you can simply scan that QR code and it'll take you to that page that we just have up there displayed. Uh, so you can get to it right from your ballot even. Okay. Yeah. And just a little bit um, <laughs> to the slide there. So as I mentioned, February 7th, we mailed out, yes, selections mailed out 19,245 ballots to the bases you see there that are having elections. Um, we mentioned the candidate booklets and the duplicate ballot process. Uh, just a few important dates to note. Uh, March 2nd, 2023, that is the last day to request a duplicate ballot at 12 p.m. Central. So you have to request it before then not after <laughs> and we don't suggest waiting till that date because keep in mind they still have to send that ballot to you and you have to be able to get it mailed back to us at the uh, post office the designated post office box 
Uh, the last day to become eligible and a member of good standing for your vote account is March 6, 2023. And of course, the ballot count itself will be March 9, 2022, right here at APFA headquarters. And I just want to make sure your vote counts, so ensure you are eligible to vote. And you can check your due status by logging into the account page on the homepage there at APFA.org and log in and you can see uh, your membership status or anything like that on that web page. It's a great resource. And then that leads us right into Eric Harris, our national treasurer. That's just a quick way. Let's talk about dues. That's here, but that's that's nice. a great job. Uh, hi. Hey everyone, so just an update on where we are as far as dues goes. We have been communicating out that the dues collections process is underway. Uh, the last time we reported out the amount, I believe it was last May, the big number of $3 million. Um, I am happy to say that we see a steady decline in the dues of rears balance here. However, the amount is not reducing at the rate we are anticipated. So our current arrears amount is, arrears amount is $2,337,521. Um, the cause of these significant arrears and the slow speed of collecting is twofold. One, um, well, first, most of our members currently in arrears are in arrears due to taking a leave of absence. Um, if you have taken a leave of absence, whether it's paid or unpaid, there is a good chance that you may be in arrears. So please check that out. Also, if you do not have enough come out of your paycheck, there uh, American Airlines will only take the full amount of dues if it is available. So at the end of all of your deductions, if you have less than the 2050, um, they will not take that 2050. So that can cause you to go into arrears. Secondly, the dues arrears alert process has been entirely manual all of these years. So we are looking into changing that. When we analyze the data, it is impossible to determine exactly when and why the amounts have increased so significantly since 2002. However, it is clear that our members intend to pay their dues. So our first step is to increase the number of alert letters that we will be sending out to the membership. Um, the alert letter process is being automated to significantly, significantly increase those alert letter numbers. Today, we send out about 15 per week because it is a manual process, uh, but we are increasing that rate to 300 per week. At that rate, we'll have alerted all 6,375 members in arrears over the next 21 weeks. Members are alerted in employee number order. That means lowest number to highest. That maintains the random order. That way we're not targeting any specific demographic there, it's just a random order. Um, in April, you'll see an upgrade to the My Account section. We'll walk through that shortly. That will provide immediate notifications to you when we do not receive your 2050 on your 15th paycheck, your 2050 on your last paycheck. We then will notify you of your dues obligations when you go out on the leave when we're notified. That way you are you understand what your responsibilities are as a member um, and what your rights and privileges are. And you'll get the same notification when you return from a week. We will provide more on-demand billing and payment transaction history. We hear we've heard from you. We know that needs to get on the website and the, the ability to download your e-statements. We know that these enhancements will provide you the email notifications that should have occurred in the past to prevent this from happening and to educate you all on our obligations under the Railway Labor Act, our collective bargaining agreements, and the APFA Constitution and Policy Bank. We'll walk you through quickly how to uh, access your account online. When you get to the APFA.org website, you'll hit account or log in. So yeah, you'll log in and then hit account and then you're uh, Will be directed to this page. Yes, this will log you in. On the left, you'll see your information. It'll have your name, your base, your employee number, your address, um, your, the ability to opt in to text messages. That is huge. You will see some new um, communications coming out via text message. We have heard from you on that as well. 
Um, so that is your opportunity to opt into those text messages or opt out should your mind change. It's also your your way of subscribing to hotlines and base briefs. I forget that I have this screen here. <laughs> Please click on the update information tab to update your information if it is not correct or if it has changed. We do know that the ability to change your email address is not there, but we are working on it. Something else that I would like for you to uh, take a look at, let, take a look at is when you click on the home page, click on my profile. That will take you to your member profile. Let's slow here at headquarters. <laughs> um, that information in the center displays your base and your membership status. That's important, especially at a time like this when we are in elections. You will also see your balances, the total balance due, and your arrears balance. Your total balance is all of your balances or, or any transactions that are due. Uh, the arrears balance is any transaction that is 60 days beyond the date of billing, which puts you in arrears, which puts you in bad standing. Then if you scroll down to my standing, you will see your eligibility to vote or to participate. If it is yes, you are good to go. If it is no, you are not. You should reach out to us or you should Click on my payments, Josh will show you there, and you can make a payment there. There's more enhancements coming to the your member profile, including your positions, your skills, your trainings and events you've attended. We are working on getting all of those records entered in, so please bear with us. If you do see something that is incorrect or missing, feel free to reach out to membership at APFA.org. We will get those records verified and updated for you. We hope that this, these enhancements will give you the visibility that you deserve as a member here. And I just want to quickly add to um, when you're updating your address and your information on that portion that Eric was just talking about, and let's say you do need a duplicate ballot, please make sure you also follow up with that duplicate ballot process that I pointed out. Um, one is not exclusive to the other, so we need your address. Obviously, we'd like you to update your address at APFA. But also, you need to let the S elections know um, your new address as well. And one more thing, the PAC was mentioned earlier that um, with the government affairs team, and currently our PAC balance is forty six thousand seven hundred eighteen dollars. <laughs> we need more. <laughs> you know how Washington works. It is a business. Um, we are excited to announce that we've had 250 new members sign up in 2002 for an average of $600. Okay, check. going towards the pack. 2022. 2022. 2002. 2002. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. Who's interested? Who's interested? Thank you. <laughs> and I just want to mention, you know, why it's so important that you're in good standing and that you can vote. Right, we have quite a few things coming up this year, most likely. I will say, um, one is the elections that we're in currently. Right, we also most likely will have a strike vote at some point, a tentative agreement for a contract, and possibly constitutional changes. So, am I missing anything, Adam? I know we've kind of gone through this. There's one more I'm missing, but this is why you need to be up to date on your dues because you want your your vote to count. You want to be able to vote. And um, so, please, we've got a short period of time to get um, this right. Go into your account and let's uh, make sure that you're up to date and so that you're in good state. Yes, and join the pack. Right. <laughs> okay, uh, that is it for us today. We're doing pretty good. We just went uh, a little bit over the hour. We want to thank all of you that joined us today. Uh, we hope you find this informative. Of course, we're always open to hearing from you and what you would like to hear about in these meetings. Please always let us know. You can email us uh, or you can call us or text us. We'll get those opt-in text going somehow or something. But um, anyhow, thank you so much. And uh, we will see you at the next quarterly membership meeting. Stay informed. Please read the hotlines. Go to the website. There's a lot of information on there. But more than anything, please stay informed right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.